This interview is brought to you by OKCoin Crypto Exchange, where you can buy, sell, and trade your favorite cryptocurrencies, and you don't have to pay high fees. OKCoin charges low fees, the lowest in the industry. You can also stake your crypto and keep 100% of the rewards. OKCoin does not charge any fees when it comes to staking. In fact, it is the only exchange where you can buy, sell, and trade Miami Coin and also stake Miami Coin at a high APY, currently at 280%. OKCoin also has a great referral program that if you refer a friend, you guys can split $100 in Bitcoin. So be sure to sign up with OKCoin, link in the description. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel, your home for crypto news and interviews. With me today is a very distinguished guest, Dr. Saifedina Moose who's the author of best-selling book, The Bitcoin Standard, as well as upcoming book, The Fiat Standard, and the host of the Bitcoin Standard podcast. Saifedean, great to have you on. Thank you for hosting me, Tony. My pleasure. Well, I've wanted to speak to you for a very long time. I read the Bitcoin Standard book, uh, just amazing. I opened up my understanding of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as a whole and the movement uh, and understanding economics and money and so forth. Um, let's start with your background. Where are you from? Where, where'd you grow up? I'm from the West Bank, from Palestine. I grew up in, uh, I grew up, well, all over. I spent a few years in Saudi Arabia as a kid, and then I spent a few, two years in uh, Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. And then I uh, spent some time in Jordan, and then I uh, spent most of my childhood back in uh, Ramallah, in uh, the West Bank. And then uh, I left there for my undergraduate in uh, Lebanon. And before you ventured into Bitcoin, and we'll talk about how you discovered it, but you know what were you doing before then? Um, what was your livelihood before you got into Bitcoin? I was a university professor at the Lebanese American University in uh, Lebanon, and I was uh, I was an economist. I studied economics for my graduate degree. Uh, for my undergraduate, I did mechanical engineering at the American University of Beirut, and then I did a master's in uh, the London School of Economics in development management, and then I did a PhD in sustainable development in uh, Columbia University in New York. And uh, then I was working as a university professor at the Lebanese American University. And then I came across Bitcoin and uh, became increasingly interested and uh, curious and uh, eventually wrote the Bitcoin standard and uh, that changed my life and now i'm uh, bitcoin all the time it's uh it's it's a pretty common experience that you know people get into bitcoin and then it just keeps drawing you in and then it consumes everything else in your life and then you have nothing in your life but bitcoin left yeah m my wife would echo the same sentiments <laughs> she because <laughs> uh, similar to you i've been sucked into uh you know bitcoin's black hole so to speak and it seems like the rest of the world is moving in that direction. So how did you come across a Bitcoin? Did someone tell you about it? Did you read about it in a forum? And what, what year was that? You know, it's it's a kind of really sad. I always get asked this question and I just don't have a good answer. I <laughs> I don't feel good enough. Uh, I, I, I don't think it would be right for me to make up a nice story. Uh, but I don't have a nice story because I honestly don't remember when I first heard about Bitcoin. Um, I remember basically by 2012, 2011, Bitcoin was this thing that I'd vaguely heard about several times before, but I hadn't understood and I hadn't looked into closely and I hadn't really spent much time uh, trying to um, look into it. So I don't really remember when I first heard about it. I Probably it was 2011, possibly even 2010, but it was very, very vague. And it was, you know, somewhere on the internet, I must have come across a mention of it. And um, around 2012 is when I started to hear about it more. But I started paying attention in 2013, 2014. That's when I started uh, really learning and reading and, try and and taking it seriously before then. For me, it was um, it was just this weird curiosity on the internet, and you know, at that time there were very little, uh, there were there were very few resources to go and read about Bitcoin and figure out what was going on. So, I didn't really um, get into Bitcoin up until I would say 2014, 2015 is when I started really uh, reading into it. And was there a particular moment, and maybe it's a time in your life, or you saw world events? 
and the two things connected of Bitcoin's purpose and and essentially the vision around it. What, what was your aha moment? Like, wait a minute. Okay, I get it. And this is what I want to uh, be be involved with. Um, so I think the way that in my case, it may have been a little bit different because I think most people, you know, they hear about Bitcoin and then they start understanding the potential. For me, I... Um, you know, I was already very much into Austrian economics and into gold and into this concept of hard money and sound money and all of these ideas that are in the Bitcoin standard. And so when I first heard about um, Bitcoin, it was in the context of, oh, people are trying to build this digital thing that's going to be like gold. And in my mind, it was just, well, obviously, it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I didn't know anything about it at that time. And so it was, you know, it was always the idea that, well, wouldn't it be neat if that thing could work? Because if it could work, it would actually really change the world. But obviously it won't work. And so then it was just a creeping realization slowly and slowly, you know, day after day, year after year, as it continues to refuse to go away, as the price continues to go up, as all of these scenarios in your mind that you think are going to destroy Bitcoin, as they all materialize and all that happens is that Bitcoin becomes stronger, then it begins to dawn upon you that actually maybe this thing is going to have legs, maybe this thing is going to be there. And then, you know, the, 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 the realization of, um, you know, maybe all those ideas that I have about uh, money and um, how money, uh, how bad money fixes, how bad money has ruined the world and how good money fixes the world, maybe all of that is going to materialize through uh, Bitcoin. So I would say it began to really sink in for me around late 2013. After the Silk Road issue and after the Mt. Gox issue, those two things I would have imagined, you know, I didn't know much about Bitcoin at that time, but I would have imagined that those, these were the kind of things that would destroy Bitcoin. Mm. And yet Bitcoin just continued to march onward and continued to rise. So that's, I think that's when it's, that's when it kind of hit me. And also another thing happened in 2013, 2014, I think. In 2014, I read an article that explained how much uh, electricity and hashing power was going into mining. And that lit a fuse in my mind because before then, you know, the, I, I wasn't really looking into it seriously. I didn't understand what mining was. I thought it was just, I thought basically Bitcoin was essentially like most uh, shitcoins today in that uh, it's just a group of people who get together and uh, make a toy currency between themselves. But when I understood that there's all this uh, uh, mining, all these equipment, all this electricity consumption that is um, being dedicated toward making this system work, and that you know this isn't just uh, uh, this isn't just a game between a few people the you know the, the rules of the game are set to the point that people are burning serious electricity in order to get their coins you can't just you know click a button and, and, and make the coins that's when i started to really think about it uh, about it having serious potential um you know to your point it's 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 simply amazing how so many things were have come along Bitcoin's way to, and we thought was going to hurt it or kill it. And yet, to your point, it just keeps getting stronger. Uh, and and I still, I'm still amazed by that fact. And even just with the mining situation we saw with China banning Bitcoin mining and the hash rate dropped, but then the miners went to other parts of the world and including the United States. And now we're seeing a Bitcoin mining boom in the United States. What are your thoughts on uh, the mining movement and, and I'm assuming it, from my perspective, I think it's great, the more decentralized, spread out the, the hash rate. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think this, this was another excellent example. So, um, you know, by this week, I think it was, or last week that uh, Bitcoin uh, uh, went over the previous all-time high, which was uh, registered before the China mining ban. And the hash rate is already back up to the levels where it was before the China mining ban. So I think, that, and, and this was, um, you know, I, having been around for a while, this was kind of uh, predictable. So I, I, I went on record um, in several interviews saying, you know, look out for this comeback because the, the bigger you hit Bitcoin, the more spectacular the comeback is going to be because the comeback is only a matter of time. So, um, 
it and 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 Bitcoin just continues to do this. It's um, it's 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 an extremely powerful. I think the way that I like to think about it is that it's an extremely powerful alignment of economic incentives. Mm -hmm. And if you study the economics, I, one one book I particularly recommend is called Forty Centuries of Wage and Price Controls." And it's a book by a couple of economists that go back to the time of the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Babylonians and look at all these examples throughout history of governments trying to mandate prices and fix prices. And um, it's it's almost like, um, you know, the, the cartoon of uh, the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote, where <laughs> <laughs> the ending is always the same. You know, the Wile E. Coyote comes up with more elaborate plans for how they are going to uh, clamp down on the market. And the Roadrunner always finds <laughs> their way around it. And Bitcoin is like that because it's 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 an extremely uh, pure form of market, and the fact that it's digital is is really the um, is is the thing that makes it so powerful. Because you know, with physical things, governments can still clamp down in extremely harmful ways, and all right, markets will recover, markets will eventually find a way. But you know, you can have seventy years of communism, and you can have starvation, and you can have um, all kinds of really destructive things take place. But with Bitcoin. Uh, because it's not physical, because there's nobody to shoot and nobody to put in jail, it just routes around whatever you do to it. So even when uh, when China, which had you know something like 50, 60 percent of all the mining hash rate, decided to ban mining, it was absolutely amazing to watch the hash rate collapse and then begin to recover. And just to think about it, you know, nothing can have this kind of resilience where you get rid of half the operating capacity and um, the, the the network continues to operate almost, almost unaffected. So it wasn't entirely unaffected. You know, the few weeks that followed had the slowest blocks in Bitcoin's history. We had the biggest difficulty adjustment downward in Bitcoin's history. The difficulty went down 29%, I think, or 28%. So we had the slowest blocks. So yeah, it did affect the network. You know, for two weeks you had very slow blocks, and even the week after, two weeks after that, you had pretty slow blocks too. But then, four, five, six weeks later, the blocks were back to uh, normal because the difficulty adjustment down uh, adjusted downward, and the miners that were in China they were exported out of China and they found homes in other places and they were installed in other places and the network recovered and uh, you know it, it affected the price badly because all these miners had to sell a lot of their coins in order to finance their relocation in order to um, you know buy new hosting space and all of that stuff yes it was pretty painful uh, for a lot of the you know if you were a Chinese miner this was obviously extremely bad but if you're a Bitcoin investor you know, uh, a 56% drop is par for the course. We've had bigger drops before. And even with the 56% drop, you know, the price was still sixfold larger than what it was uh, a year earlier. So uh, again, you know, the thing, the key thing about Bitcoin is there's always going to be a lot of oscillation and volatility in the short term. But if you think about it as a long-term thing, it's always going up in the long term. Um, there's a lot of new people coming into the crypto market um, and a lot of people discovering Bitcoin, obviously with the price action, the, the growth of the asset class adoption. Um, and a lot of people are intrigued by the price movements, right? That's many times how they come across it. But I would love if you can give us your thesis for Bitcoin in layman's terms for someone who's new, right? That it's more than just price here. This is something that's going to change finances and currency and money and so forth. Um, and, you know, with your economic background, I, I would love if you can kind of give, give, give that thesis for, for folks who, who are new to the market. Yeah, so I mean, let me first just say that I think you know the, uh, price is a pretty central thing in the um, in, in the in the entire value proposition and in the technology. The price is an enormously important part of this, um, and I think you know um, a lot of Bitcoiners jokingly like to call it uh, the number go up technology. And this is what Bitcoin does. It's the technology for <laughs> making the price go up, and uh, you know this isn't a very popular thing. 
to say because it sounds pretty, you know, uh, materialistic and brash uh, in a way. But it's true. I think the really remarkable thing about Bitcoin is that it is a form of money that is resistant to inflation, and that therefore leads to its value appreciating. And that means um, because nobody can inflate it, nobody can control the supply, that means that the value can't come down. So then if you want to store money in it, you expect it to go up over time. I think this is really the starting point. I mean, a lot of people... Um, uh, a lot of people can kind of uh, get into the space and uh, particularly I think academics and this is something that I did which was kind of um, out of the um, out of the um, you know the, the ordinary way of doing academic things you know as an academic you're not supposed to really be too much focused on um, issues of money making but in my book, you know, I couldn't avoid it. I couldn't pretend that this was about blockchain technology and it's about, you know, the way that the blockchain is structured and the databases and all of the stuff that under the hood, you know, all of that is there to make Bitcoin work. But what matters in Bitcoin, the most significant thing about it is the fact that the number goes up. <laughs> that's that's really the, 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 the thing that is... Um, that's that's what drives the adoption. That's what drives the security model, and that's what drives all the important implications of Bitcoin. It's 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 completely um, meaningless to say that you know uh, Bitcoin, uh, you know the price doesn't matter. No, the price matters. If the price stops rising, Bitcoin stops working. Uh, the security model fails. Adoption fails. Um, all the others, all all the other aspects of Bitcoin are interesting. Um, from an operational perspective, but really, ultimately, what matters is the fact that the number goes up, the price goes up, and I think the significance of this, uh, and the point that I try to make in my book, and I think um, perhaps the reason why my book has been so popular is because you know I didn't shy away from this, and I just try to explain why it happens and then uh, explain the implications of it. So the reason it happens is because nobody can increase the supply. And this is the first time that we have anything like this, you know, for anything in the world, the more valuable it becomes, the more the people who produce it will produce more from it. And that's true for your national currencies. It's true for your precious metals. It's true for regular metals. It's true for anything. If people want to buy this thing and hold it as a form of money, the people who can make it will make more of it. There's no exception to this except Bitcoin. It's the one thing that we know for a fact nobody can make more of it. And this is, of course, what distinguishes Bitcoin from the other digital currencies, in my opinion, because we know for a fact that, you know, with Bitcoin, they've broken the mold. The mold for making more Bitcoin has been broken. There's nobody in charge. There's no master key. There's no admin. There's nobody who can change the code and make more Bitcoins. Whereas with all the other digital currencies, you know, they're able to hard fork quite regularly. And so that allows them to increase the supply if the need arises. And in my opinion, you know, the fact that they haven't increased the supply um, in many of those currencies so far is um, is a function of the historical circumstances. But, you know, if we get to a point where these currencies are used as the global reserve currency, you're going to get banking collapses and you're going to get uh, budget problems and you're going to get uh, political entities that are extremely powerful that would like to get more of this money. And there are ways to do it. You know, central banks were supposed to be independent and they have all these checks and balances and all these democratic institutions and political uh, constitutions and everything out there to protect their central bank, the central bank's independence. And yet, when push comes to shove, governments get their way and the central banks print the money. So right. I think, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's not something that's there in the code. It's not a program that you just put in the code. It's, it's, it's unique to Bitcoin and Bitcoin's evolution and the way that Bitcoin has evolved and the way that Bitcoin has proven over the past 12 years that it is resistant to change. Nobody's been able to change any of the main consensus parameters of Bitcoin. So uh, this is why it happens. And I think the implication of it is enormous. And that's the main focus of my book, which is that uh, since 1914, the world has not had hard money. It's not had sound money. It's not had money that is chosen on the market. In the market, the point that I make in the book is that on the free market, people will naturally choose the money that holds on to its value the best. And even if they don't choose it, that money is going to end up having the majority of, of wealth on the market or all the wealth on the market, even without people understanding it or choosing it, simply because of the fact that 
um, you know, if you put your money in things whose supply can be expanded, you're going to watch the wealth that you store in them dissipate and go to the people who um, go to the people who produce more of those things. So this is why copper is not money, and it couldn't be money. Even if the one million richest people in the world, you know, all the world's billionaires and many of the world's millionaires, or all the world's millionaires and billionaires, if they all decided tomorrow that they wanted to make copper into money, and they all sold all of their gold dollars euros real estate uh, all of their store of value everything that they don't use as a consumption good if they saw sold all of that and put all of their money into copper in order to make copper the next world money that still wouldn't matter it still wouldn't be money because it's very easy for copper miners to mine more copper and so the result of this is that all these rich people will end up with massive amounts of copper stored in warehouses rusting yeah. and the price of copper would crash and all these people would be destitute uh, they would just simply lose their wealth so in in this world you know it doesn't matter what we agree upon it doesn't matter what a lot of people like to say money is a social convention money is uh, a, a a common mass hallucination uh, a lot of people like to use these ideas i think it's complete nonsense it doesn't matter how hard you hallucinate that copper is money and how many people join you in the hallucination supply and demand means that copper miners are going to flood the mar market with copper and it's going to bring the price of copper down gold miners can't do the same there's very little gold compared to the existing stockpiles of gold that's the key thing so the total supply of gold that we have in the world has been accumulating over thousands and thousands of years without any consumption taking place because gold can't be consumed it can't be um it can't rust it can't ruin and so therefore we're always accumulating more and more gold and we're always stacking more and more gold onto the stockpile so any year's annual production is tiny compared to the existing stockpile that's why gold is money and not copper. That's why copper was demonetized a long time ago. And that's why, in my opinion, and I explained this more in detail in the book, silver has also been demonetized since the 19th century. Gold ended up being the world's only money by the end of the 19th century for a very good reason. It's the hardest money. So based on that analysis, uh, and then uh, we apply the same thing to national currencies. We look at the national currencies of the world. We see that the ones whose supply increases the most they devalue the quickest and they witness hyperinflation and the ones whose supply increases the least are the ones who maintain their value best so the us dollar the euro the swiss franc the british pound the japanese yen these generally have had much lower inflation than um, the other currencies and so they contain the majority of value in them and that's why you know people in um africa and latin america and asia they want to hold dollars and euros and people in the us don't want to hold um, african and latin american and um, asian uh, currencies because they're very quickly inflating so i think this the the issue of hardness which is how difficult it is to increase the supply in my opinion is the most important determinant of monetary status in the long term mm. and that's uh you know all of that is the main um, is the lead up to the analysis of bitcoin which shows us which come which comes to say well bitcoin has um has currently you know at the time when the book was published the supply growth rate was around four percent per year now it's two percent per year and it's going to drop even further every four years it drops by half so bitcoin is going to have the lowest supply growth of any money and so if the previous analysis is correct, which I believe it is, which is why I wrote the book, then um, it follows that uh, Bitcoin is going to be best at holding on to value and you're going to expect Bitcoin's price to continue to appreciate significantly over time. And in fact, that's what we've seen. The value of Bitcoin has roughly gone up about tenfold since the writing of the book or since the publication of the book. So um yeah i think I, th I think the main thesis has been validated in that regard and so then the kind of the more interesting well interesting i guess depends on who's reading it but uh, an another part of the book is the implications of what happens if we go back to having a form of money where people can store their wealth in the money safely 
and nobody can manipulate the supply of money. And that's where it gets into the political and social and um, uh, wider economic aspects of uh, wider economic issues surrounding uh, money, where um, you know the, the chapters, the three middle chapters of the book, uh, five, six, and seven get into these issues, the issue of time preference and saving, the issue of um, the use of money as a medium of exchange and uh, as a unit of account, how it facilitates global trade and how it um, allows people to have sovereignty over their own wealth rather than strengthening government. And I think the implications of this are enormous. Um, we've seen a lot of the gold bugs are now moving to Bitcoin. And just recently, Paul Tudor Jones um, legendary hedge fund uh, investor, uh, he said, you know what, I prefer Bitcoin now versus gold. So do you see a lot of the capital that's sitting in gold moving to Bitcoin and potentially central banks, which are holding uh, gold, also holding Bitcoin? Yes. I, I mean, I think definitely in terms of the uh, private capital mm. that is in, um, in the, the private capital that's in gold is definitely, I think, beginning to consider moving into Bitcoin. And it's happening much faster than even I had anticipated. Um, I think it's, it's, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that gold is really being demonetized at this point in time because we've had enormous inflation over the last 10 years and the price of gold has been practically um, constant. And I think it's because of an increasing amount of industrial use of gold. Mm -hmm. And um, that means the stockpile of gold is declining. And so new production is more significant compared to the stockpile. And so then more inflation doesn't lead to gold appreciating like you would expect it to. And I think the deeper issue is just that you can't have banking built around gold. This is the thing. By banning gold from moving around, governments have basically banned gold from uh, assuming its monetary role. So yeah, people want to use it as a store of value, but people simply cannot um, maintain it, um, cannot maintain the, the role the role of money with gold. You can't just trade uh, gold across borders because there are no gold banks and governments don't license them. So I think we are witnessing gold being demonetized in this regard. So, you know, you already, you couldn't trade it. You couldn't use it for trade. Um, and you already had to pay massive fees on every exchange in which you buy and sell gold. But now on top of that, um, you've got the alternative that is uh, Bitcoin, which is appreciating at a much faster rate. So Bitcoin is, gold's been flat over the last 10 years or so. Um, Bitcoin has averaged 200% uh, compound annual growth rate, 215% over the past 10 years. So it's an astonishing track record. And so, I mean, no matter how much of a gold bug and of a com no matter how much of a committed gold bug you are, you can't dismiss this. And then what I think see I see happening with a lot of gold bugs is you know they start off with a small allocation to gold to Bitcoin. But then that allocation <laughs> naturally mushrooms and then becomes the majority of their allocation while um, their gold uh, allocation stays uh, stable. Now, whether the central banks are going to do that is, I think, a different question. I'm not so sure. Mm. Um, I think uh, there are good reasons to expect that central banks are not going to be very keen on Bitcoin. In fact, maybe this is my bias, but I would prefer if they don't. I'd prefer if the uh, growth of Bitcoin comes uh, on the market, on the private sector, with just people accumulating more and more. And I, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd see institutions develop that are like the alternative to central banks that are private sector institutions uh, built around Bitcoin. Hopefully, the central banks stay out of the game. And I think, you know, there's some good reasons to, just, to suggest this will be the case because they. Um, I think they're, they're the least likely to see the value proposition in Bitcoin because they are the ones who, you know, they're the ones who's, uh, whose business model Bitcoin disrupts the most. So, yeah. So if you're a central banker, you don't see a problem with monetary policy and you don't see a problem with the job of the central bank.
Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I, I mean, uh, we've seen even folks at the IMF and so forth, they're very <laughs> anti-Bitcoin, saying a lot of negative things about it, because like you said, it disrupts their model. Um, so there's a lot of adoption happening, and I'm, I'm watching this unfold, and, and my mind is just blown. It's happening on multiple levels. Um, obviously, you have corporates putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet, MicroStrategy, Tesla, and others, and we're anticipating more. We have energy companies. A lot of them are now taking the excess wasted energy mining uh, Bitcoin and becoming more profitable. Um, we got countries like El Salvador making a legal tender yesterday. There was rumors of Zimbabwe, where it is massive hyperinflation, looking to make Bitcoin a legal tender. Are, you, are we seeing hyper Bitcoinization happening? It, it just seems like every avenue and pathway Bitcoin is taking a position here. I mean, I think so. I mean, um, you know, the, uh, I mean, th this is a matter of expectations. Like, what do you define as a hyper Bitcoinization? Um, uh, and and the, the term can kind of be a little bit leading in the sense that it implies something extremely fast. But I think 200% per year appreciation is extremely hyper, is extremely fast, in my opinion. And, um, you know, I think uh, every person who wants to get into Bitcoin is going to need to spend some time to learn about it. And um, there's, you know, there's the learning aspect of it. But I think the real limitation as well on top of that is the um, is, is, is the um, is the liquidity um, mm -hmm. issue. It's just, you know, everybody's uh, every business has its cash receipts and its expenditures denominated in dollars or in their local fiat currency. And it's not easy to switch completely to a Bitcoin standard from a dollar standard. So in order to do that, you need to uh, slowly, um, you know, work slowly gain a position in Bitcoin and then slowly accumu uh, accumulate the position larger and larger. And as more and more people do this, you're going to start seeing more and more trading taking place in Bitcoin and being denominated in Bitcoin. I think it's a it's a gradual market process that has to run its course and it can't be rushed. The, the, we can't just, you know, no matter how good Bitcoin is, we can't have something um, like, you know, tomorrow everybody just switches to Bitcoin. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a slow process that's going to naturally takes well slow again is relative but it's a process that's going to need some time and um, i think uh, if you told me 10 years ago you know 10 years ago i was pretty skeptical of bitcoin i may have not even heard about bitcoin but i heard about it very vaguely if you told me that 10 years from now um, they're going to be um, large tech companies that use bitcoin as a reserve asset there will be uh, more than a trillion, uh, 1.2, 1.3 trillion dollars in circulation of Bitcoin, and that you're going to even have a country using Bitcoin as legal tender, I would have said, yep, that's extremely hyper, extremely fast. That is hyper Bitcoinization. Sure, it's not the whole world yet, but for 10 years, this is astonishing. You know, 10 years ago, um, the price of a Bitcoin was what, maybe $5, $2, something like that. Uh, it's an enormous, enormous leap in 10 years. Well, well, I think it's extremely unreasonable to expect it to go much faster than this. Well, sure. And, and but wouldn't it be, you know, it's, it's just a matter of one domino falling in each respective silo or pathway, so to speak, corporates, energy companies, countries, you know, as a legal te legal tender, and then game theory plays out, right? Uh, given what we talked about with the price appreciation, uh, there's a financial incentive there um, and true hard money and, and all the other attributes that are great. It's just getting those dominoes to fall and then the rest seem to follow it. Yeah, that's the thing. Like I think um, a lot of people seem to think that, you know, um, they they um, they think of Bitcoin adoption as being, you know, we need uh, Bitcoin needs all of these evangelists to go around. But the reality is, you know, these as as Bitcoiners, uh, you Bitcoin doesn't need us. Bitcoin doesn't need us to be around out there telling people. What draws people in is the promise of appreciation or the potential for appreciation. 
that's what uh, makes uh, Bitcoin interesting. And um, I think that's just, uh, as I argue in the book, it's, 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 it's an inevitable process in markets. Right. Um, people who choose the hardest money manage to keep their wealth and witness it appreciate. People who choose easier monies manage to lose their wealth and watch it dissipate. And so um, you can understand this and learn it the easy way, <laughs> or you can learn it the very hard way. <laughs> So do you feel as a uh, human civilization, and I'm getting kind of uh, stepping out of a bit on this one, for looking at it from a 30,000 foot level, are we making a leap here? Is this like a, another leap in civilization where we're tr we truly have hard money, we're going digital, the world is more connected and, and people, we can fix a lot of the problems our maybe our grandparents and great grandparents experience. I don't know if I'm off target here, but is is like this technology, Bitcoin, taking us to that next level? I very much think so. I think um, I think what we've witnessed over the last century, and I argued this in the, in the in the Bitcoin standard and in my next book, the Fiat standard, which comes out next week. Um, I think I think the last century has been a complete anomaly by historical standards, mm -hmm. in that all of human history, we as a human as a human species we've naturally moved toward harder and harder money. And that has allowed us to become better and better at storing our wealth for the future and providing for our future selves. And that's resulted in our ability, in our lowering of our time preference, which means time preference is the degree to which you discount the future. So everybody discounts the future compared to the present. But the more you're able to save for the future, the less you discount the future, the more you provide for the future. And so the more you live with the future in mind. And I think that's um, that's that's a process that has just been uh, taking place all throughout human history. And then it took a massive uh, U-turn in the 20th century because by the end of the 19th century, we the, the whole planet was using gold as money. Practically the whole planet was on gold standard. And that meant, uh, you know, everybody could store their wealth in a form of money that was pre that was uh, inflating at only about two percent per year every year. So everybody, whatever you did, wherever you lived, you were getting paid in gold, and you could store that gold under your mattress, and know that you know one year, two years, five years, ten years from now, without you having to do anything, without it having to. Um, without you having to take on any risk, you knew that if you just held on to this little gold coin, five, 10, 20 years later, you could take it out and you could have the value that you put into it and most likely significantly higher. Well, not significantly on short periods. It was like maybe one or 2% appreciation, but this was something that was available for pretty much most humans all over the world by the end of the 19th century. If you just earned the money, you stored it, five years later you came back and you could buy more things with it five years later than you could buy when you first stored it. And that's an enormously powerful technology if you want to think about it, in that it just provides you with peace of mind, it provides you with the ability to think in the, for the long term, and it provides you with, um, it, it makes you lower your time preference, it makes you start to think more about your future, about your family, about how to live your life for the future and that's um th th that's really what lowers our time preference and then we get to the 20th century and we move from a money that appreciates at two percent whose supply increases at about two percent per year to uh, the average in the last 60 years from 1960 to 2012 i ran the numbers and we see that national currencies have increased in supply on average and that's an average weighted by volume. So it's not a numerical average of all the inflation rates all over the world. The numerical average is like 32%. So the average fiat currency uh, increases by 32%. But this, this is the overall average where you weigh all the currencies equally. So the Venezuelan Bolivar gets as much weight as the US dollar. But that's, so that's not fair. That's not a very good comparison. I think a better comparison is um, weighing them by their market capitalization so that the US dollar is weighs much more. So because 
many more people are using the US dollar than the Venezuelan Bolivar. But still, when you run the numbers that way, you get something in the range of 40%, 14%. So the average fiat user has experienced 14% increase in the supply of their money every year. And so 14% is really, um, it, you know, that's the money supply losing half of its value in five years. So the average fiat user who puts their fiat money under the mattress and digs it out five years later is going to expect to have to see it have lost 50% of its value. Of course, in some situations, he'll lose 99.99%. Some situations, he'll lose 100%. In some places, he'll lose 1% per year, maybe 2% per year. But on average, this is what you're uh, losing. And so I think this has been enormously, enormously impactful on human society. It has made us more high time preference. It has made us prioritize the present. It has made us discount the future. It has uh, made us think less about the importance of family for the future. It has made us think less about um, saving, less about providing for a future, more about living in the moment. And I think you see this reflected in, in all aspects of decision making. You know, people who are more high time preference are more impulsive less um, measured, less uh, concerned with the indirect consequences of their actions, more likely to do things that are destructive for themselves in the long run and destructive of others, more likely to engage in conflict, more likely to um, aggress against others because the potential for suffering the consequence from those things is usually delayed into the future whereas the gain is immediate. So if you're impulsive, you're more likely to steal because you discount the possibility of getting caught and suffering uh, the consequences of it. And I think we see a lot of this stuff um, in the 20th century. And I think we see this increase in time preference across the board, all over the world. And we see it, I also argue, we see it reflected in art. We see it reflected, you know, artists used to spend uh, years and decades uh, working on masterpieces. And now we see artists, you know, they spend 15 minutes scribbling things uh, that your five-year-old could uh, repeat in 15 minutes. And then they tell you a story about why this is actually profound and important, even though it involves zero skill, zero craft, zero effort, uh, zero... Um, uh, zero hard work, really. I think all of this, um, I argue, and I obviously make the argument in more detail in the Bitcoin standard and in the fiat standard, but I think a lot of this is a result of um, messing with the money because money is an enormously important part of our lives. Money is one half of every economic transaction and it is uh, the medium with which we transact with our future selves usually. We save in money. And so when you mess with the money, you mess with, with all of our transactions and our ability to save for the future. Um, I want to get your thoughts on El Salvador and what they did of legalizing Bitcoin. They're mining Bitcoin with volcanic energy. Uh, do, you, do you think other countries are going to follow this model? Um, obviously, they use the U.S. dollar, uh, and, and it's not maybe the perfect model for every country, but do you see others following suit? Um, I mean, to be honest, I thought I, I was massively surprised by what um, El Salvador did, I think, like most people. And I'm, um, I'm, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't have any particular insight into how other governments are going to be behaving. So I cannot pretend to predict how other governments will behave. Um, so far, it's been, what, now six, seven months uh, since they've made this announcement. And we've not seen... No, wait, not six months. It's been five months since they made the announcement. We haven't seen other countries follow suit. Perhaps some will. Um, but whether they do or not, I really think um, Bitcoin's growth and adoption is a market process. I think government recognition, government implementation of these legal tender laws is really a recognition of the reality of the market. It doesn't create the reality of the market. And this is, I think, a very, very important distinction between um, mainstream economists who generally believe that money is the creation of the state and Austrian economists from uh, the Austrian school, which I consider myself from, who believe that money is the choice of the market. And so 
in my opinion, you know, gold is money because the market chooses it as money and then government just formalizes that choice and puts the picture of the king on the coin and um, tries to turn it into a specific denomination with a specific weight of gold and try and regulate that. But they can't impose the choice of money on the market. Uh, governments can't really do that. And so I think uh, Bitcoin is another example of something like this. It's uh, whether other countries do announce it or not, I think it's uh, the, the the real driver of the process is the um, is the market process. And I think it is the our old friend number go up technology that uh, <laughs> determines what happens. Um, so I want to talk about your upcoming book, The Fiat Standard. Uh, Tell us about it, and how did, why did you go with the fiat standard as a title? Obviously, your previous book, Bitcoin Standard, but uh, I'm curious about that. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the Bitcoin Standard explains why Bitcoin works, and it uh, explains why it's likely to succeed, but it doesn't discuss much how it will succeed and how it will rise in a world where we have uh, fiat money that is uh, the dominant form of money and so um this was the you know the main question that people were left with at the end of the bitcoin standard the main question people were asking well then what happens and how is it gonna rise and what are governments gonna do about it and so on and so i i as as i was trying to think about how to answer those things i started writing a bunch of papers about these questions and the more that I try and answer this question, the more that I realize the best way to answer it is to dig deep into uh, how fiat money works. And that's where the idea of the title came to me. So we did the Bitcoin standard first, we do the fiat standard and it'll follow the similar structure. And I think the key insight was, um, you know, the, the Bitcoin standard was massively successful. It's been translated to like 30 languages. People all over the world have, um, enjoyed it and told me they've benefited from it and i i was really surprised by that because i did not write it thinking it would be a popular book i wrote it as an academic but i think that approach of just you know there are no experts in bitcoin nobody knows what bitcoin is bitcoin is just this brand new species of money that was invented and um, i just came at it from first principles you know what is going on in this bitcoin thing how does it work Let's look under the hood and explain it. You know, it's just like um, you're on an island and a car shows up on a deserted island. You've never seen a car before. And, uh, you know, you try and you figure it out, you figure out how it works, and then you try and explain it from first principles. Just what is it, how it works, why do you need to put the gasoline and why do you need to move this thing? And that approach seemed to have worked very well for Bitcoin. So then I decided, well, why not just do the same thing for fiat? And so the book begins by studying fiat in the same way that the Bitcoin standard studied uh, Bitcoin. And so that's um, that's kind of the motivation for why I made the book that way. Um, and when is the release? It's, it's this month, right? Yes, November 16th. Perfect. So I'll put a links in the description to that, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to to read that. Um, I did want to touch on something I forgot to ask you earlier. Um, the daily transactions of Bitcoin uh, in the sense of commerce. Um, right now, obviously, we, we know a lot of folks are holding it as a store of value, hard money, and so forth. And there's another layer being built on it, which is the Lightning Network. What are your thoughts on that? Um, obviously, I, I don't think it's a, it's a feature. I don't think necessarily a bug, but Bitcoin's the mining, and it could take some time when the network gets clogged a bit, sometimes to process uh, transactions. You know, what are your thoughts on that and, and uh, what's being built to, to speed that up? I think, um, you know, on chain, and one of the other main arguments in my book was the idea that Bitcoin on chain is not uh, a payment network that can scale for consumer payments. Mm -hmm. And I run some numbers on, you know, Bitcoin scale, Bitcoin's capacity, compare um compare them to regular uh, current payment networks bitcoin can't do anywhere on chain bitcoin can do nothing near what paypal 
or um, Visa or MasterCard can do. I mean, it's just an entirely different uh, scale. So Bitcoin does seven transactions per second or something like that, five transactions per second. Visa does 2,000. So it's not something that just can be uh, scaled easily. And um, uh, yeah, it's it's part of the way that the structure of the, uh, the Bitcoin's time chain works. It just doesn't uh, lend itself for mass volume of payments. But that's fine because uh, the second layer solutions will emerge that are going to involve trade-offs in terms of um, security, but uh, much faster payment processing. And I think, in my mind, I think the, the Lightning Network is the uh, likely solution for this problem. It's the most important solution. I think, and um, you know, we've seen the um, incredible success of implementing this in uh, El Salvador. So a lot of people were skeptical about the Lightning Network, and a lot of people thought it would take a lot longer. And I must say, I thought it would still take longer for the Lightning Network to develop because at current scale, you know, um, if you understand Bitcoin's value proposition, you quickly realize, you know, you don't want to be spending your Bitcoins. And so I thought we're going to be in this phase for longer. And I thought it's going to be a while before we get something like um, uh, mass consumer payments. But then El Salvador did it. And whatever you think about the decision, um, there's no denying the fact that it works. I know a lot of people who've gone to El Salvador and have paid at their local restaurant, at the local fast food chain. They've paid with the Lightning Network and they've paid, um, you know, the, the fee for the transaction is 0 0.008 cents or something like that um, per transaction. So it's severely cutting down on the value of credit card payments it's extremely fast and um, it's it's working and i think um, the fact that we have this proof of concept in el salvador shows that it can work and it can scale and in fact the more people hop on the lightning network the more it scales the more efficient it becomes the more reliable and the faster the transactions will become because um there's unlike on chain where there is limitation by the fact that you have redundancy built in, in with bitcoin so that the more transactions you add the more computing uh, requirement you have with lightning it's different the more people can come on the network the more uh, liquidity there is and the more payments can clear quickly a um, couple more questions and we'll wrap it up uh, do you have a bitcoin price prediction for this bull bull market um and you know do you see us hitting 500,000 in 2024 and then a million in 2020 as some people are predicting you know do you follow any stock to flow models or anything like that um i th i'm um uh, you know my my uh, my default model for understanding bitcoin's price is the stock to flow model i think um I'm generally highly skeptical of numerical methods of looking at price and numerical analysis and numerical predictions of price, but I cannot dismiss how incredibly accurate this model has been built, yeah. uh, has been over the last couple of years. It's basically never been outside the two standard deviation area. It's, it's never been more than two standard deviations away from the predicted price, and it's only very briefly been more than one standard deviation away. So the whole China crackdown and the mining collapse and all of that stuff barely took the price out of the one standard deviation range, and now we're back in the same one standard deviation range. So I, I think it would be extremely, extremely... Um, it's extremely cavalier to say that the model has just been a coincidence. I think it's very clearly reflecting something very true, which is uh, that the ratio of, and, and of course, the, the inspiration for the model was my book. It's the issue that I was mentioning earlier about the stock to flow ratio and the uh, increase in the supply of the uh, metal. That's why copper is not money because the stock to flow for copper is very low, but gold is money because the stock to flow is very high. So I think this is quantifying it and it's showing that this is a very strong relationship. And the fact that it continues to hold when we have very good theory to expect, explain why it should hold, which is, you know, it's, it's the market value of the new productions being added onto the market. I think, um, I, I think it's difficult to dismiss it. So I, I 
would go by it. I think we're going to spend the next three years around the uh, 100,000 range of price. And then I think 2024, 25 is when we do another 10x roughly, and then spend the next three years around the $1 million range. Uh, well, I would love to see that. <laughs> um, I want to wrap it up here with some quick rapid fire questions, such as mm -hmm. your fa favorite food? Steak. Uh, favorite musician or band? Um, an old classical Egyptian singer called Um Kulthum, who died in the 1970s. I listen to her all the time. Classical old Arabic music, very low time preference stuff. She um, she had a 60 year career and she had like two hour long songs. Uh, incredible wow. stuff. <laughs> uh, favorite movie? Um, I don't like movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, maybe at some point someone's going to try to make your book or something into a movie so we'll see it's i guess yeah. yeah i'll make an exception <laughs> then. um well favorite book favorite book is a difficult one for me to answer because there's so many and it's um i i don't read fiction so it's not like books that i have um, i mean i do read fiction but i don't read a lot of fiction um it's like i mean it, it, it it's it's difficult to say really i mean i guess Human action for Mises is great. Um, Rothbard's um, books, Rothbard's America's Great Depression is a great book. It's very influential on me, but it's difficult to pick one. That's the tricky part. Um, <laughs> I could just say my book obviously is my favorite because you know my book changed my life. And <laughs> um, and when you're not doing anything Bitcoin, you know what are you doing for fun as a hobby pastime? um i play and watch football a lot oh really I'm a football fanatic yeah oh that's cool well american football or or, uh, or international no soccer. international football soccer oh yeah yeah, yeah. i'm oh. a liverpool fan oh very cool uh Seyfedean, just a pleasure chatting with you and i i'm always learning when i listen to you and i'm looking forward to your new book uh the fiat standard and looking forward to reading it so thank you for joining me today thank you so much Oh, this was so much fun for me too. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.